In the late 1990s and early 2000s, hundreds of MLB players took steroids. Barry Bonds, however, is the only one to get sentenced to house arrest for lying about it. In 2007, he was an all-star who led the entire league in on-base percentage. The next year, despite being willing to play for the league minimum, not a single team offered him a contract. Barry Bonds was essentially excommunicated by MLB for a ton of reasons. One of these reasons was the media, who might have treated Barry Bonds worse than any other player in recent memory. And this contributed to Barry Bonds becoming one of the most hated players in MLB history, which started well before he ever took steroids. In college, his teammates voted for him to be kicked off the team even though he was their best player. In Pittsburgh, he was blamed for costing the Pirates the World Series, even though he was their team's best player. He fought multiple teammates in the clubhouse and on the field. He threw a pizza in one of their faces, tried to fight his general manager, got into a verbal altercation with his real manager, got accused of domestic abuse, allegedly assaulted a journalist, and according to one writer who interviewed 500 of Bonds' acquaintances to write a book about him, Barry Bonds is a a quote, evil, evil man. Barry Bonds went through controversy after controversy during his career, making him the perfect scapegoat. And this narrative began forming all the way back in high school, where several incidents made one talent evaluator describe his personality by simply calling him a quote, asshole. I've never changed. There's not one friend that you ever talked to that says Barry Bonds is any different from when he was in high school. Barry Bonds didn't give a sh then. Barry Bonds don't give a sh now. <laughs> Barry Bonds was the son of MLB All-Star Bobby Bonds. Barry Bonds' godfather was Hall of Famer Willie Mays. Barry Bonds' cousin was Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson. All three were known to be treated unfairly by the media during their careers. Barry Bonds witnessed this as a kid, and many point to his family background as the origin to his distrust and confrontational attitude towards the media. Yeah, I've interviewed Barry Bonds. You know what? He's a jerk. He's condescending. He intimidates the hell out of you. Barry Bonds' family background also means he was basically born to be the greatest baseball player ever, and he truly might have been. In high school, he hit close to 500 over four years, got a scholarship to Arizona State, got drafted in the second round, but still somehow didn't make the Northern California High School All-Star Game. This was because he fell asleep in the bullpen in the middle of the tryout. This led to Bonds having a less than stellar reputation, which followed him to Arizona State. His coach at ASU was a huge fan of Bonds, but admitted that he, quote, never saw any of his teammates care about him. Bonds was the best player on the team, and according to these stories, acted like it. While playing in center, he once ran off the field and paused the game for 10 minutes just so he could go to the bathroom. As a sophomore, he was caught being out past curfew. When his coach found out, he went to the team and asked them to vote on whether or not he should kick Barry off the team, expecting them all to vote no. Surprisingly, every single one of his teammates, except for two, wanted him off the team. His manager was shocked and decided he couldn't kick Barry off because the vote wasn't unanimous and lowered his punishment to a 10 mile run which Barry never did. It was reported that this incident pissed off Barry's dad so much, he drove his truck onto the field, parked it in front of the dugout, and confronted the manager in the middle of a closed practice. Bonds also went through his first drug scandal at Arizona State after several players accused the team's coach and team psychiatrist of recommending and pressuring players to take antidepressants because they thought it would improve the players' on-field performance. This scandal seemingly ruined the team, leading to their worst season during Bonds' career at ASU. Barry Bonds, however, was amazing. After three years, he proved he was one, if not the best player in the country. He was drafted six overall by the Pirates and was promoted to the major leagues after just one minor league season. And in 1990, he broke out, winning a gold glove, silver slugger, and MVP award at 25. The Pirates were emerging as one of the best teams in the league, and Bonds had solidified himself as their best player. But according to the press, a lot of his teammates and fans 
hated him. In 1988, Bonds got into an altercation with teammate Andy Van Slyke, who was upset with Bonds after he got out at home because he was jogging to the plate. Van Slyke confronted Bonds in the clubhouse, which led to punches being thrown. But instead of their teammates breaking up the fight, they apparently joined in, took Van Slyke's side, and all beat up Bonds together. This began a string of negative press coming out against Bonds, which eventually forced him out of Pittsburgh. In 1990, he made comments that criticized an injured teammate who had to miss a start in the playoffs, an opinion that was widely unpopular in the clubhouse. After that series, he got into an altercation with another teammate on the plane and ended up flipping a pizza into his face. The next year, Bonds was vocal that he believed he was underpaid, and despite being under team control for another two seasons, he told the media that if the Pirates didn't pay him a $3 million salary, he would quote, leave Pittsburgh and haunt them the rest of his career. He ended up not getting the $3 million he wanted, and according to one account, tried to fight the team's general manager during the arbitration meeting. After this, Bonds publicly called the Pirates out. Carl, trade me. You know, to save yourself a lot of grief, you can just trade me and not have to worry about it. I'll see you when we play. Bonds wanted out of Pittsburgh, but was stuck. And when he reported to spring training that year, things boiled over. Oh, you know, I snapped. While warming up, Bonds became annoyed that he was being filmed by a camera crew. Yeah. Get it out of my face. A Pirates employee confronted him, saying that the cameras were asked to be there, and Bonds fought back. Then, a Pirates coach confronted Bonds. Not liking how Bonds was addressing the coach, manager Jim Leland came over and ripped Bonds to shreds. Bonds later acknowledged that he was in the wrong and Jim Leland had every right to tear into him, but also said he believed the Pirates set him up and that they put a camera and a microphone there to make him look bad. This video created a firestorm and basically gave the press an excuse to dig up any negative rumor about Bonds and trash him for it. Peter Gammons heard he was a pain on MLB's tour of Japan, saying there was a rumor about him throwing a Japanese player's gift on the floor. Also saying that one anonymous player said Bonds was the second worst thing to happen to Japan since the bombing of Hiroshima. And even a report said that Dick Vitale told somebody that he was a pain during the baseball slam dunk contest. Whether it was fair or not, the media painted Bonds in the worst light possible, making him a villain in his own city. But despite all this negativity, he dominated. He finished second in MVP voting that year. The next year, he won it. He won three gold gloves in a row, three silver sluggers in a row, two MVPs, led the league in OPS four years in a row, and this was years before he ever touched steroids. Bonds was hands down the most complete player in baseball, but in many ways was treated like an afterthought. Players like Ken Griffey Jr., Frank Thomas, Randy Johnson had inferior numbers, but had way more star power. And even in Pittsburgh, the press called him childish, said the Pirates made a mistake by not trading him, and called him selfish for not signing for less money. And Bonds had legitimate reasons to be up upset with the Pirates. For example, they refused to give him the $3 million salary he asked for, yet paid his teammate Andy Van Slyke, who was significantly less productive, a $4.3 million salary. These two famously didn't get along, and their beef climaxed in the biggest game possible, and according to Van Slyke, may have cost the Pirates the World Series. Because Barry Bonds was dominant, but he did have one critique on his game. He sucked in the playoffs. I mean, it, it was horrible. Bonds won MVP and helped carry his team to the playoffs for the first time in 1990. When he got there, he disappeared. And you were just like, <laughs> choking right here. The next year, the Pirates were a game away from the World Series, but lost. That postseason, Bonds only batted 148. Good, sir. <laughs> 
his slumps and so forth. He's going to continue to the series. What slump? Same thing that happened last year. Who's slump? Your slump. Your batting. Uh, so I have a slump. Then, the very next year, they found themselves in the same situation. The Pirates entered the ninth inning of Game 7 up two runs and at this point only needed one out to go to the World Series. According to Andy Van Slyke, at this point he told Bonds to play more shallow. Bonds looked at him and gave him the middle finger. Francisco Cabrera then hit a single at Bonds whose throw was off just enough to allow the winning run to score by an inch. According to Andy Van Slyke, if Bonds had been playing more shallow like he told him to, Bonds would have had a better chance to throw out the runner and this could have been a completely different outcome. Despite winning MVP that year, the press focused on his playoff performance and claimed his stock was quote, at an all time low. In reality, the opposite was true. That offseason, the Giants gave Bonds the biggest contract in Major League history. The Pirates had lost their best player and according to them, couldn't be happier. One writer said that they threw a parade when Bonds left. When he returned to play the Pirates the next year, he was booed. Fans threw fake money onto the field and according to reports, when he went to the Pirates locker room to say hello to his old teammates, they completely ignored him. And as much controversy that Bonds went through in his final few years in Pittsburgh, the controversy he faced in his first few years with the Giants was a lot worse. In his first spring training, it was reported that he punched Padres outfielder Phil Plantier in the face after he threw a bat at Bonds in the batting cages. Even though he got punched in the face, Plantier apparently apologized to Bonds. Bonds again was thrown into scandal after scandal. An adult actress sued him, claiming that she was pregnant with his child. This turned out to be false, but was still printed everywhere. He then went through a messy and extremely public divorce which the press followed and reported on almost daily. Bonds ended up going to court to lower his child support. The judge ruled in his favor, but afterwards asked him for his autograph. In a 1995 court appearance, his ex-wife accused him of assault, citing five different incidents throughout their marriage. As serious as these allegations were, Bonds was also in hot water for minor things, like Bowie Mays reportedly being upset with Bonds because he didn't accept his MVP award in person. And the media even published an open letter from a high school history teacher who accused Bonds of parking in a spot reserved for teachers to use the high school field to work out during the school day, which he says distracted his students. Bonds was getting torn apart for serious accusations by the media, but was also seemingly getting just as much grief for things that in all honesty shouldn't have even been stories. This speaks to his relationship with the media, which boiled over in 1996 when it was reported that he pushed a reporter in the clubhouse because according to Bonds, he had been waiting in the clubhouse for an interview for too long. But despite all this constant negativity, as as usual, he absolutely destroyed the league. As soon as he got to San Francisco, he won his third MVP, made the All-Star team six years in a row, won five gold gloves, and never had an OPS under 1,000. By 1999, Bill James not only named Bonds as hands down the best player of the 90s, he ranked him the 34th best player of all time while only being 33 years old with a third of his MLB career ahead of him. And all of this was without steroids. Bonds was already one of the greats. However, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire were setting home run records, becoming national icons, and despite both having worse numbers, were crowned by the public as the players of the 90s. Turns out these players were on steroids, and it seems like the accolades they were getting inspired Bonds to do the same. In 1999, Bonds showed up to spring training noticeably heavier. He also started bringing his new trainer, Greg Anderson, into the clubhouse. Six years later, this trainer would be in jail. According to one account, over the next several years, his hat size grew two sizes. His jersey went from size 42 to 52. His shoe size went from 10 and a half to 13, and Bonds would gain at least 55 pounds from his days in Pittsburgh. At 35 years old, Bonds hit more home runs than he had his entire career, and at the time, the overall public 
didn't seem suspicious. The next year, he broke the single season home run record by hitting an insane 73. When the Diamondbacks decided to intentionally walk him, their fans booed their own team. His reputation was at an all time high. However, it didn't last because the next year featured a fight with a teammate, his most crushing defeat, and a story that ruined his career forever. But before we get to that, a quick word from today's sponsor. Your time is valuable, guys, and so is your health, which is why I love that Factor sponsored this video. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals created by gourmet chefs directly to your door. Going to the store, picking things out, bringing it home, prepping the things you bought, cooking it, then cleaning it takes a ton of time. Factor doesn't. It shows up already prepped, and after quickly cooking it, you can enjoy it and clean it up in no time. I eat Factor meals constantly for this very reason, helping me make more videos that hopefully you guys will enjoy. On top of that, they have something for everyone, including 34 chef-prepared, dietitian approved weekly options, an assortment of 36 sweets, smoothies, juices, and amazing add-ons, as well as a wide range of vegan and vegetarian options. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code BASEBALLDOZEN50 to get 50% off your first order. Yes, that is 50% off and all you have to do is go to factor75.com or click the link in the description and use code BASEBALLDOZEN50. Do it right now. In June 2002, a groundbreaking article written by Tom Verducci exposed baseball steroid problem to the public for the first time. Bonds was mentioned in the article as a suspicious case, and this is when the questions about steroids started being asked. Later in the season, he fought his own teammate Jeff Kent after Kent supposedly berated second baseman David Bell after he made an error. Bonds stuck up for Bell, causing a dugout fight in front of the world. Turns out these two had been beefing for years. When they first met in spring training a few years earlier, Bond supposedly told Kent he was sitting in his seat on the team bus and had to move to the back. Kent refused, and they had tensions ever since. After this fight, Kent said that he and Barry had fought on at least a half a dozen occasions and said, quote, I don't care about Barry, and Barry doesn't care about me or anybody. Also adding that on the field, they were fine. And that part seemed true. Jeff Kent won MVP that year and Bonds placed second. Together, they took the Giants all the way to the World Series. And finally, Bonds performed, putting up World Series numbers that would have gone down in history. Unfortunately, once again, Bonds' team lost in heartbreaking fashion, blowing a 3-2 lead in the series. The next season, only a month after the passing of his father, news broke that a company Bonds had ties to had been raided and was being investigated for selling steroids. Bonds was finally officially linked to PEDs, causing a media firestorm which eventually tarnished his career for good. You wanted me to jump off the bridge, I finally have jumped. You wanted to bring me down, you finally have brought me and my family down. Finally done it. A few months later, Bonds' trainer was indicted for his involvement in steroids. For Bonds, this meant accusation after accusation. Next question. Next question, because it was stupid. That offseason, Bonds had to testify in front of a grand jury where he told the judge that he had never knowingly taken steroids and that he had been giving substances from his trainer that could have been steroids, but at the time, he thought they were flaxseed oil. Nobody in the world believed this, and lying under oath is a federal crime. Bonds was later indicted for perjury for saying this and faced prison time for obstruction of justice. Bonds was the biggest target in sports and was being questioned day after day and had no choice but to deny everything. All you guys lied. All of y'all. Should you have asterisk behind your name? All of you have said something wrong. All of you have dirt. When your closet's clean, then come clean somebody else's. But somehow, in the middle of all this turmoil, Bonds was having arguably the most dominant stretch in baseball history. He won four MVPs in a row, led the league in OPS, slugging, on-base percentage, and walks four years in a row. During those four years, he accumulated more war than five entire teams 
During that same span, he accumulated more war than Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, and 34 other Hall of Famers had in their entire careers. And Bonds did it from age 36 to 39. This insane stretch put him on pace to break the all-time home run record at a time when the entire sport was enthralled with steroids. Player after player was getting accused, but Barry was still playing at the highest level, fairly or unfairly making him the face of steroids. And worst of all, he was chasing the most sacred record in baseball. What should have been one of the most celebrated pursuits in history was met with boos, negative articles, non stop questions about steroids and sign after sign calling Bonds a fraud. At 42 years old, Bonds had an OPS over 1,000, led the league in on-base percentage, intentional walks, and passed Hank Aaron for the all-time home run king. However, the next year, despite being willing to play for league minimum, not a single team in baseball offered Barry Bonds a contract. For many, including Bonds, this was a clear-cut case of collusion. He was being blackballed from the league, but teams argued they weren't willing to risk signing a player who was in the middle of being indicted by the U.S. government. Finally, in 2011, Bond stood trial and was convicted for obstruction of justice, stemming back from his 2003 court appearance where he allegedly falsely claimed he never knowingly took steroids. He was sentenced to 30 days of house arrest. However, in 2015, after 12 years of court cases, the decision was reversed. Unfortunately, the damage was done. Bonds' career was over, going down as one of the most successful, dominant, and controversial careers in Major League history.